Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jared Rand, and welcome to the Global Guided Meditation Call for Monday, November 28th, 2022, after 3 p.m. Eastern. We will be having a Time for Change call this Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. To learn who and what we are is a is a choice, it's a decision, a devotion. We have different dimensions within us. We have different levels within us of discovery, of understanding. It may sound all, you know, uh, complicated or technical, but it really isn't. When we embrace within, this is part of our journey. So when you've heard the the old saying that uh, God took six days to make heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. This is very confusing for many because they take it literally. It really means that the God within us worked through the six chakras and the seventh chakra rested. And with the seventh, we disappear as part of duality. All polarities disappear and all distinctions disappear. Night is no longer night. Day is no longer day. Summer is no longer summer. And winter is no longer winter. Matter is no longer matter. Mind is no longer mind. We have gone beyond is what this means. This is the transcendental space that has been referred to by many, Buddha, Maitreya, La, uh, Lao Tzu, Nirvana. These three meanings ins- inside of us and the achievement of the fourth have another dimension as well. When we identify four states, sleep, dream, waking Korea. Korea means the fourth. The beyond. The metta. These seven chakras and the work through them have a correspondence with these four these four states as well. The first meeting, the Modhar and the Vatasan, is like sleep. The meeting happens, but you cannot be very aware of it. You will enjoy it. You will feel great freshness arising in you. You will feel great rest, as if you have slept deeply, but you will not be able to see it exactly. It is very dark. The man and woman have met inside you, but they have met in the unconscious. The meeting was not in the daylight. It was in the dark night. The result will be felt. The consequence will be felt. You will suddenly feel a new energy in you, a new radiance, a new glow. You will have an aura. Even others may start feeling that you have a certain quality of presence, a vibe. But you will not be exactly alert to what is happening. So the first meeting is like sleep. The second meeting, this is all within us. The second meeting is like dreaming. When the Manapura and the Anahata, 
Neat. Your meeting with the inner woman is as if you have met in a dream. And you can remember a little bit of it. Just as in the morning, you can remember the dream that you had last night. A little bit here and a little bit there. A few glimpses. Maybe you had last night of the dream. Maybe something has been forgotten. Maybe the whole is not remembered. But still you can remember. The second meeting is like dreaming. You will become more aware of it. You will start feeling that something is happening. You will start feeling that you are changing, that a transformation is on the way, that you are no longer the old person. And with the second, you will start becoming aware that your interest in the outer woman is lessening or your interest in the outer man is not as infatuating as it used to be. With the first, there will also be a change, but you will not be aware of it. With the first, you may start thinking that you are no longer interested in your woman, but you will not be able to understand that you are not interested in any woman at all. You may think that you are bored with your woman, and you will be happier with some other woman. A change will be good. A different climate will be good. A different quality woman will be good. This will be just a guess. With the second, you will start feeling that you are no longer interested in the woman or the man, that your interest is turning inward. With the third, you will become perfectly aware. It is like waking the Vishuddha, meeting the Agya. You will become perfectly aware. The meeting is happening in the daylight. Or you can say it is in this way. The first meeting happens in the dark middle of the night. The second meeting happens in twilight time between the night and the day. The third meeting happens in full noon. You are fully alert. Everything is clear. Now you know you are finished with the outer. It does not mean that you will leave your wife or your husband. It simply means that the infatuation is no more. You will feel compassion, and certainly the woman who has helped you so far is a, a great friend. The man who has brought you so far is a great friend. You are grateful. You will start being grateful and compassionate to each other. It is always so. When understanding arises, it brings compassion. If you leave your wife and escape to the forest, that's simply shown you are cruel and compassion has not arisen. It can be only out of non-understanding. It cannot be out of understanding. If you understand, you will have compassion. We will all become enlightened sooner or later. When Buddha became enlightened, the first thing he said to his disciples was, I would like to go to Yashadara and talk to her, his wife. Ananda was very disturbed. He said, what is the point of your going back to the palace and talking to your wife? You have left her. Twelve years have passed. And Ananda was also a little bit disturbed because how can a Buddha think about his wife? Buddha are not expected to think that way. When the others had left, Ananda said to Buddha, this is not good. What will people think? You see where the ego plays in there? Buddha said, what will people think? I have to express my gratitude to her. And I have to thank her for all the help she gave me. 
and I have to give something of that which has happened to me. I owe that much to her. I will have to die. He went back, went to the palace. He saw his wife. Certainly, Yashadara was mad. This man had escaped one night without even saying anything to her. She said to Buddha, couldn't you have trusted me? You could have said that you wanted to go, and I would have been the last woman in the world to prevent you. Couldn't you have trusted me even that much? And she was crying. Twelve years of anger. This man had escaped like a thief in the middle of the night, suddenly without giving a single hint to him. Buddha apologized, and he said, it was out of non-understanding. I was ignorant. I was not aware. But now I am aware, and I know that's why I have come back. You have helped me tremendously. Forget those old things. Now there is no point in thinking about spilt milk. Look at me. Something great has happened. I have come home, and I felt my first duty was toward you to come and to convey and to share my experience with you. The anger gone, the rage subsided. Yashadora looked out through her tears. And yes, this man had changed tremendously. This was not the same man she used to know. This was not the same man, not at all. He looked like a great luminosity. She could almost see the aura, a light around him. And he was so peaceful and so silent, he had almost disappeared. His presence was almost absence. And then in spite of herself, she forgot what she was doing. She fell at his feet, and she asked to be initiated. When you understand there is bound to be compassion, that's why I don't say to my sannyasins to leave their family, be there. Ravindranath has written a poem about this incident. When Buddha goes, Yashadora asked him one thing. Just tell me one thing, she said. Whatever you have attained, I can see you have attained. Whatsoever it is, I don't know what it is. Just tell me one thing. Was it not possible to attain it here in this house? And Buddha could not say no. It was possible to attain it there in the house. Now he knew because it has nothing to do with forest or with town, with the family or with an ashram. It has nothing to do with any place. It has something to do with your innermost core. It is available everywhere. First, you will start feeling that your interest in the other is loosening. It will be a dim phenomenon, dark, looking through a dark glass, looking through a very foggy morning. Second, things become a little clearer, like a dream. The fog is not so much. And third, you are fully aware. It has happened. The inner woman has met the inner man. The bipolarity is no longer there. Suddenly you are one. Schizophrenia has disappeared. You are not split. With this integration, you become an individual. Before that, you were not an individual. You were a crowd. You were a, a mob. You were many people. You were multi-psychic. And suddenly you fall into order. That's what this ancient story is saying, the man had asked for three days. If sometimes you look into these small stories, you will be wonderstruck. Their symbols are great. The man had asked for three days to sit silently. Why three days? 
Those are the three points in sleep and dream and waking. He wanted to put himself in order. First it happens in sleep, then it happens in dream, then it happens in waking. And when you are in order, the whole of existence is in order. When you are an individual, when your split has disappeared and you are bridged together, then everything is bridged together. It will look very paradoxical, but it has to be said. The individual is the universal. When you have become an individual, suddenly you see that you are the universal. Up to now, you have been thinking that you were separate from the existence. Now you cannot think that. Adam and Eve disappear, have disappeared into each other. This is the goal that everybody is trying to find in some way or another. Tantra is the, is the surest science for achieving it. This is the target. The Moladhar has to be relaxed. Only then can the energy move upward, inward, and inward and upward mean the same. Outward and downward mean the same. Energy can move inward or upward only when the Moladhar is relaxed. So the first thing is to relax the moment heart. You are holding your sex center very tight. The society has made us very aware of the sex center. It has made us obsessed with it. We are holding it tight. We can simply watch. We are always holding our genital organs very tight. And if we are afraid that something will go amiss if we relax, our whole conditioning has to keep it upright. When you relax it, leave it to self. itself. Don't be afraid. Fear creates tension. Drop the fear. Sex is beautiful. It is not a sin. It is a virtue. Once you think in terms of its being a virtue, you will be able to relax. We talked about how to relax the Moladhar, and we talked about how to relax the Vadasan. It is the death center. Don't be afraid of death. There are the two fears. These are the two fears which have been dominating humanity, the fear of sex, and the fear of death. Both fears are dangerous. They have not allowed us to grow. Drop both fears. The third chakra is the Manapura. It is loaded with negative emotions. That's what and why our stomach becomes disturbed when we are emotionally disturbed. The Manapura is affected immediately in all the languages of the world. We have expressions like, I cannot stomach it. It's literally true. Something or sometimes when you cannot stomach a certain thing, you start feeling nauseous. You would like to vomit. In fact, sometimes it happens. Psychological vomit sometimes has said something, and you cannot stomach it. And suddenly you feel nauseous. You vomit. And after vomiting, you feel very relaxed. There's many different physical applications we can employ. In yoga, we have methods for it. The yogi has to drink a large amount of water in the morning, a bucket full of water with salt. The water has to be lukewarm, and then he has to vomit it. It helps to relax the manapura. It is a great process and great cleansing process. You will be surprised. How many modern therapies have become aware of that vomiting helps? It releases the manapura. The tantra and yoga have always been aware of it. The negative emotions, anger, hatred, 
jealousy, and so forth, have all been repressed. Our manapura is overloaded. Those repressed emotions don't allow the energy to go up. Those repressed emotions function like a rock. Our passage is blocked, encounter, encounter, gestalt in therapy, like that, all functions unknown, unknowingly on the Manapura. They try to provoke your anger. They try to provoke your jealousy, your greed. They provoke your aggression, your violence, so that it bubbles up and surfaces. The society has done one thing. It has trained us to repress all that is negative and pretend all that is positive. Now both are dangerous. To pretend that positive is false, hypocrisy, and to repress the negative is dangerous, it is poisonous, it is poisoning our system. To express the negative and allow the positive. If anger comes, don't repress it. If aggression comes, don't repress it. Tantra does not say go and kill a person, but does say that there are a thousand and one ways to express the repressed emotions. We can go into the garden and chop wood. You ever watch woodcutters? Have you ever cut wood? They look more silent than anybody else. Have you watched hunters? Or have you been a hunter? Hunters are very good people. They do a very dirty thing, but they are good people. Something happens to them while they are hunting, killing animals. Their anger, their aggression is dissolved. The so-called nonviolent people are the ugliest in the world. They are not good people because they are holding down a volcano. You cannot feel at ease with them. Something is dangerously present there. You can feel it. You can touch it. It is oozing out of them. You can just go into the forest and shout, scream, primal. Therapy is just scream therapy, tantrum therapy, and encounter, and primal, and gestalt. All are of tremendous help in relaxing the manapura. You ever felt like just screaming? Literally, have you ever been to the point in any situation where you just felt like screaming? Once the manapura is relaxed, there arises a balance between the negative and the positive. And when the negative and positive are balanced, the passage is open. And the energy can move higher. The manapura is, is male. If the manapura is blocked, then energy cannot go upward. It has to be relaxed. Anything that can be of help has to be used. Because man has been so damaged that all sources of help should be made available. Now, we may not even be able to understand why I am making available all the methods, the, the yoga, the tantra, the Tao, the Sufi, the Jaina, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Gesalt the psychodrum, encounter, primal therapy, polarity balancing, rolling, structural integration. Many people have never heard of these things being done in any place, anywhere. In the East at all. There is a reason for it. Man has been damaged so much that all sources should be tapped. Help should be taken from every source possible. Only then there is hope. Otherwise, man is doomed. We cannot keep this cycle. We must go within and understand who and what we are. 
in these different levels in the chakras, how important these energy centers are. You see how much that we have forgotten and why it is so imperative that we go within? It is a choice, obviously. The fourth chakra is the Anahata. Doubt is the problem with the fourth chakra. If you are doubting, if you're a doubting person, your fourth chakra will remain unopened. Trust opens it. So anything that creates doubt, it destroys your heart. The Anahata is the heart chakra. Logic, logic chopping, argumentativeness, too much rationality, too much of Aristotle in you. Destroy the Anahata, philosophy, skepticism, destroy the Anahata. If you want to open the Anahata, you will have to choose to be more trusting. Poetry is more helpful than philosophy. And intuition is more helpful than reasoning. And feeling is more helpful than thinking. So you will have to shift from doubt to trust. And only then does your anahata open. Does your anahata become capable of receiving the male energy from the manapura. The anahata is female. It closes with doubt. It becomes frigid with doubt. It becomes dry with doubt. It cannot receive the male energy. It opens with trust. With trust, moisture is released in that chakra, and it can allow the penetration of the male energy. Then the fifth, the Vishuddha, non-creativity, imitativeness, parroting, monkeying. These are all damaging. The Vishuddha is destroyed by copying. Don't be an imitator. Don't be just a carbon copy. Don't try to become a Buddha and don't try to become a Christ. Be aware, be aware of books like Thomas Kemp's book, Imitation of Christ. Beware, no imitation is going to help. The Vishuddha is destroyed by non-creativity, imitation, and it is helped by creativity, expression, finding your own style of life, being courageous enough to do your own thing, art, song, music, dance, inventiveness are all helpful, but be inventive. Whatsoever you do, try to do it. Just do it in a way, in a new way. Do it to bring some individuality into it. Bring some authentic signature. Even cleaning a floor, you can do it in your own way. Even cooking food, you can do it in your own way. You can bring creativity to everything that you do. It should be brought. And as much as you are creative, the Vishuddha will open. And when the Vishuddha opens, only then can the energy move into the Agya, the third eye center, the sixth center. This is the process. First cleanse every center, purify it. Be aware of what damages it and help it so that it becomes naturally functioning. Blocks are removed. Energy rushes. Beyond the sixth is the Sahasra, the Turiya, the 1,000 petaled lotus. You bloom. That's exactly what it is. Man is a tree. The Moladhar is the root. The Sahasra is the blooming of it. The flower has bloomed. Your fragrance is released to the wind. That is the only prayer, that is the only offering to 
the feet of the divine. Borrowed flowers won't do. Stolen flowers from the trees won't do. You have to flower and offer your flowers. Now the sutras of the Sahasra, the Sarah, the first, for the delights of kissing the deluded crave, declaring it to be the ultimately real, like a man who leaves his house standing at the door, asks a woman for reports of sensual delights. Knowing is symbolic. Symbolic of any meeting between yin and yang, between male and female, between Shiva and Shakti. Whether we are holding hands with a woman, this is a kissing, hands kissing each other. Or you are touching her lips with your lips, that is kissing. Or your genital organs together, that too is a kiss. So the kiss is symbolic in Tantra and all, of all meetings of opposite polarities. Sometimes you can kiss just by seeing a woman. If your eyes meet and touch each other, there is a kiss. The meeting has happened. For the delights of kissing, the, the deluded crave, the people who are not alert at all to what they are doing go on hankering for missing the other man, the woman, woman, the man. They are continuously hankering to meet the other, and the meeting never happens. The absurdity of it is this. We hanker and hanker and desire and desire, and nothing but frustration comes into our hands. This is not the ultimately real meeting. The ultimately real meeting is that which happens in the Sahasra. Once it has happened, it has happened forever. That is real. The meeting that happens outside is unreal, momentary, temporal, just a delusion. It is like a man who leaves his house standing at the door asks a woman for reports of sensual delights. A beautiful smile. Sarah Haas says that holding the hand of a woman outside while the woman inside is waiting to be yours and forever yours is just like a man who leaves his house standing at the door asks a woman for reports of sensual delights. First, leaves his house. You are leaving your house, your innermost core, in search of a woman outside, and the woman is within. You will miss her wherever you go. You can go on running all over the earth and chasing all sorts of women and men. It is a mirage. It is a rainbow search. Nothing comes into your hands. The woman is inside and you are leaving the house. And then, standing at the door, that too is symbolic. You are always standing at the door by the senses. Those are the doors. Eyes are doors. Hands are doors. Genital organs are doors. Ears are doors. These are all doors. We are always standing at the door looking through the eyes hearing through the ears, trying to touch with the hands. A man continuously remains at the door and forgets how to go inside the house. And then the absurdity of it. You don't know what love is. You ask a woman about the delights, about her experience. You think that by listening to her experience, you will become blissful. It is like taking the menu for the food. <clears throat> Sarah Ha is saying that first you go out of yourself, stand at the door, and then you ask others what delight is. 
what life is, what joy is, what God is. God is waiting all the time within you. He resides within us. And we are asking others. And do you think that by listening to them, you will come to any understanding at all? The stirring of biotic forces in the house of nothingness has given artificial rise to pleasures in so many ways. Such yogis from afflictions faint for they have fallen from celestial space, unveiled into vice. First, sex is not the ultimate in pleasure. It is just the beginning, the alpha, the ABC of it. It is not the omega. Sex is not the ultimately real. It is not the bliss supreme, but just an echo of it. The Sahasra is far away. When our sex center feels a little happiness, it is just a faraway echo of the Sahasra. The closer we come to the Sahasra, the more happiness we feel. When we move from the Moladhar to the Vajrasthan, we feel happier. The first meeting of the Moladhar and the Vajrasthan, which are chakras, is of great joy. Then the second meeting is of even greater joy. Then the third meeting, you cannot believe that more joy can be possible. But still, more is possible because you are still far away. Not very far, but still at a distance from the Sahasra. The Sahasra is just incredible. The bliss is so much that you are no more. Only bliss is. The bliss is so much that you cannot say, I am blissful. You simply know that you are bliss. At the seventh, you are just a tremor of joy, naturally so. Joy happens in the Sahasra, and then it has to pass six layers. Much is lost. It is just an echo. Beware. Don't mistake the echo for the real. Even in the echo, something of the real is there. Find the thread of reality in it. Catch hold of the thread. Start moving inward. The stirring of biotic forces in the house of nothingness has given artificial rise to pleasures in so many ways. And because of this delusion that sex is the ultimate in pleasure, So many artificial things have become very important. Money has become very important because we can purchase anything for money. We can purchase sex. Power has become important because through power we can have as much sex as we want. A poor man cannot afford it. Kings used to have thousands of wives, even in the 20th century. The Nissan of Hyderabad had 500 wives. Naturally, one who has power can have as much sex as he wants. Thousands of other problems have arisen because of this delusion that sex is the ultimately real money, power, prestige. The stirring of biotic forces in the house of nothing. It is just imagination. It is just imagination that we are thinking it is pleasure. It is auto-hypnosis. 
auto-suggestion. And once we auto-suggest to ourselves, it looks like pleasure. Just think holding the hand of a woman and you feel such pleasure. It is just auto-hypnosis. It is just an idea in the mind. The stirring of biotic forces. Because of this idea in the mind, our bioenergy is stirred. It is stirred sometimes even while looking at a Playboy picture. There is nobody, just lines and colors, and your energy can be stirred. Sometimes just an idea in the mind and your energy can be stirred. Energy follows imagination. The stirring of biotic forces in the house of nothingness. You can create dreams. You can create, you can project dreams onto the screen of nothingness. It has given artificial rise to pleasures in so many ways. If you watch the pathology of man, you will be amazed. People have such ideas that you cannot believe what is happening. Some man cannot make love to his woman unless he looks at pornography first. The real seems to be less real than the unreal. He becomes excited only through the unreal. Have you not seen it again and again and again in your own life that the real seems to be less exciting than the unreal? Remember to change your consciousness from the imaginary to the real. Always listen to the real. Unless you are very, very, very alert, you will remain in the trap of the imaginary. The imaginary seems to be very satisfying for many reasons. It is under your control. You can have my nose as long as you want in your imagination. You can think whatsoever you want to think. Nobody can hinder it. Nobody can enter your imagination. You are utterly free. You can paint anyone as you want. You can imagine anyone. You can expect. You can make whatsoever you want of anyone. You are free. The ego feels very good. That's why when a master is dead, he finds more disciples than while he is alive. With a dead master, disciples are completely at ease. With a living master, they are in difficulty. Buddha never had as many disciples as he has now after 25 centuries. Jesus had only 12 disciples, now half of the earth. Just see the impact of the absent master. Now, Jesus is in your hand. You can do whatsoever you want to do with him. He is no longer alive. He cannot destroy your dreams and imaginations. If the so-called Christians had seen the real Jesus, their hearts would stop fluttering immediately. Why? Because they would not believe. They have imagined things. And Jesus is a real man. You could have found him in a pub, drinking with friends and gossiping. Now... This doesn't look like the only begotten Son of God. It looks very ordinary, doesn't it? Maybe he is just the carpenter, Joseph's son. But once Jesus is gone, he cannot interfere with your imagination. Then you can picture and paint and create images of him as you like. Far away, it is easier. The imagination has full power. The closer you come, the less and less power your imagination will have, and you will never be able to see unless you drop your imagination. So is the case with all other pleasures. The stirring of biotic forces in the house of nothingness 
has given artificial rise to pleasures in so many ways. Such yogis from affliction faint, for they have fallen from celestial space, unveiled into vice. If you imagine too much, you will lose your celestial space. Imagination is samsara. Imagination is your dream. If you dream too much, you will lose the celestial space. You will lose your divinity. You will not be a conscious being. Imagination will outweigh you. It will overburden you. You will be lost in its fantasy. You can hunt in your fantasy. And you can think that it is samadhi. There are people who faint, and then they think they are in samadhi. Buddha has called samadhis wrong samadhi. So too, Saraha says that it is a wrong samadhi. Imagining about God going on into your imagination, feeding your imagination, nurturing it more and more, fantasizing more and more, you will faint. You will lose all consciousness. You will have beautiful dreams of your own creation. You, un you understand and you begin to realize that there's a lot of symbolism words and comparisons that vibrate with us, which we have never really thought or really looked at because of all of the illusion of this material physical world. And this is all about going within and understand the inner workings of the gods that we are within these bodies. It's when, when, when one is to say, go within, it's meaningless to most because they don't know where even to begin to go within. And all go within is, is take an about face from the outside and face the true reality of the gods that we are inside and what that means. It's a choice that we make. We either keep going in a circle jerk on this planet over and over and over and over again, or we break free and we discover who, who and what we exactly are. This is the freeing of the gods that we are in these bodies. It is no longer the containment, it is the expanse. And it is no longer the expanse. It is the beyond. And it'll vibrate with you in this quiet time, in your heart mind. Don't try to understand it. Just let it in. I'll join you in the meditation, and I'll return to close this out.
take an easy and slow breath in through the nose. And then easy and slow breath out of the mouth. Remain still. The essence of eternal life is flowing within each and every one of us right now. Look. Where does it come from? If you dive just a bit deeper today, you'll be presented with something extraordinary, an essence that contains an infinity of magical possibilities. This is who you really are an essence that contains an infinity of magical possibilities take this with you for the rest of the day into the evening and night into the following morning we will return here Tuesday November 29 2022 3 p.m. Eastern to continue our global guided meditation call.